These are the top 10 conspiracy theories ever talked about on the Joe Rogan experience. What's the official story? The official story is that he killed himself, right? Yep. yep. He killed himself in the bunker with yeah. Ava Braun. Yep. And is there any photographic evidence of his death or anything? Yeah. So what the Russians got the body and they got his skull. Um, and when they brought it back to Moscow, nobody has ever been able to independently verify who and what this body is. They let one genetic test occur and the body with the bullet holes that they said was Hitler and have said, and that's the narrative, that's the story, that's the, all the eyewitness accounts that are in, even in the vicinity of co co collaborating with each other um, and cooperating each other's testimony. Like the closest version, because none of it seems to be very accurate, is that, okay, here's Hitler's skull. And when they did the genetic testing, it's that of a 35-year-old woman. So they're like, oh, well, this isn't Hitler. But they've said for the past 80 years that this is Hitler. So, okay, first, before we start throwing stones at Russia, let's go back to 1945, April, um, in Berlin. You have the Allies coming in, wrecking shop, dropping bombs, blowing everything up they can in every single which way. You have the Russians coming in from the opposite direction. They don't even have enough guns to arm all their soldiers. So if they have 200 guys they have, or 200,000 guys, they have 100,000 guns. If the guy in front of you dies, you just pick up his gun. That's what's happening in April of 1945 in Berlin. So the noose is tightening. There is no – I mean it is chaos, anarchy, pandemonium. This, I mean you couldn't – this is hell on earth is Berlin 1945. So I don't know if you could get a real story, a real, the way that we do it now where we have, you know, this forensic experts that come in and um, document everything. And we look at all the different testimonies, say, this is, this is exactly how it's just not, it's not CSI. This is 1945 Berlin. It's crazy. So I don't so know. So there's, there was no like, absolute proof no and a lot of nazis did escape and go to south america the majority of anyone with power if you watch the press conference again i was balls deep in this stuff for yeah. years the press conference from 1969 when they returned from the moon is one of the most cryptic weird things you'll ever see these guys look like they just stole something and they're being questioned it's it's hmm. the it's i've never seen a video where people look like they're more full of shit than that video of the press conference from 1969 it's okay. weird man it's weird they're like fidgety and looking nervous like they're getting away <laughs> so with they something didn't do it then they might have done it they might have uh, been forced to say some things that they didn't yeah. want to say and that could be part of it absolutely you know they could have done it but there's a lot of weirdness with the moon landing. Mm -hmm. It's it's if you wanted to have like a conspiracy that to wrap your head around that's exciting, it's one of the best ones. The really, but who bene who back, benefits from it? The United States government did because it showed military superiority over, over the Russia. Russians, yeah, and we were okay. able to do that. Sure. It also, you know, it was the Nixon administration. People were just flat out full of shit. Well, yeah. I mean, they were just lying to people left and right back then. That's government, though. Yeah, but even more so then because it was unchecked. There was no media. Social media. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing that would uh -huh. expose them for this. And this stuff, I mean, they would air it on TV once in 1969. You never see it again unless yeah. you watched it on film. There's no YouTube where you can yeah. go back and or watch the astronauts on trampolines video that's my favorite one you watch that and you go what in the fuck is happening there these guys are bouncing up in the air mm -hmm. like how are they doing that like they never did if you watch apollo 11 when they were moving around on the surface of the moon it's just like they're moving in slow motion mm -hmm. and then you go to uh, whatever it was like th apollo 14 or 15 when they were doing the trampoline thing they're just fucking flying through the air <laughs> have you seen it i've not i know I, i've never gotten to the moon thing the flat yeah, earth watch thing this. is ridiculous watch this and it, like their feet are hidden. Look at this. Watch these guys bounce up in the air. It's like they're on some sort of wire. Like they're gonna be being yanked up into the air. Oh yeah. Like what the fuck are they doing? And they're playing, like falling down, and it's very weird. But it could have <laughs> been that they were really on the moon, and these guys were fucking cowboys and yahoos, and they wanted to b bounce That's around. Oh, you were so you were posting those videos. Yeah, I posted those in the videos back uh, in the day. Yeah, I, I had a debate on Penn Gillette's 
radio show with a, a guy who's an astronomer. And he wasn't willing to admit a lot of stuff that was a fact, like the fact that Werner von Braun was a Nazi. Well, and why does the flag look so still there? Well, the flag had a wire, first of all, on the top of it that stiffened uh. it up to make it. But there's there's videos of the flag moving in uh, a non-existent breeze, which is weird, too. And yeah. there's, they try to make some logical explanations for why the flag could be moving in a vacuum. And some of it makes sense, but some of it doesn't. Hmm. So, like the the wires one is weird. If you watch them fall down, like go to that one right there, Jamie. You like if you watch like sometimes they're falling down, and when they're falling down, it looks like they get yanked back up. But I think it might not have been real footage. What they might have done is use some test footage, like right there, Jamie, right there. Let it go. Like homeboy falls down, and then it looks like he gets yanked back up. Look at this. Whoops. Oh, he did not. That like, is not is him that? standing up. Yeah. What is this? That's not Look. him standing up. You can't stand up like that. Right, but you're on the moon, okay? Nah, so you realize nah. you're in one sixth Earth's gravity. But there was no, there was nothing to make him go like this. Exactly. Right. You can't get right. up without. Exactly. Now we go back to MMA because that's yeah. what these freaking folk style wrestling's the next generation of MMA. Because you have again. to turn to your base to get up. You can't look at. There's nothing on the ground. How's he going to get the momentum? He's getting to go? yanked up. Like you, he would have super abs. He would have to be like no, a break you dancer. can't because. Okay, maybe a breakdancer. <laughs> maybe a breakdancer. But you can't... One of the things I find most striking is the presence of Antarctica on ancient maps because we didn't discover it until 1820. And yet it's on maps drawn in the 1500s with great detail, which again were based on much older source maps that have now been lost to us. Um, the astonishing thing is the, the so-called Pinkerton world map. I don't know if you can, if you can find it, Jamie. Uh, drawn, I think, in 1813 or 1818, based on the latest exploration data at that time. And where Antarctica is, Antarctica is, yeah, that one, keep going right, that one. That, that one you've got up at the top there. It just shows a hole where Antarctica is. Mm. Because they did, it was an honest map. Nobody right. had found it by then. But if you go back to, for example, the Wolsey-Wuller world map drawn in 1530 or thereabouts, you find Antarctica is present. If you can find Wolsey-Wuller world map, it would be worth taking a look at. Um, Orontius Phineas. Go for Oron or Orontius. Mm -hmm. O-R-O-N-T-E-U-S. Phineas. F-I-N-N-A-E-U-S. The Orontius Phineas map. That map shows shows Antarctica mm -hmm. exactly where it should be. And it shows it, there we go, mm -hmm. right-hand side. There's Antarctica at the tip of South America, mm -hmm. just south of South Africa. And what did they call it back then? Well, they call it the Southern Land. Um, and, it's, and it's larger than it is today, but it was larger than it is today during the Ice Age. Antarctica was a much bigger... Now, what the fuck is it doing on a map drawn in the 1500s, which we know was based on older source maps when nobody knew it existed in the 1500s? To me, the obvious answer is we are dealing with the fingerprints of a lost civilization that mapped the world and that left evidence of that mapping, which ancient map makers found and used and incorporated into their maps. These maps can be very confusing because they were trying to mix exploration data from their own period with data from the older maps. But when you look at these maps in depth, they're very, very intriguing. You want to hear another conspiracy theory that, that you probably don't know is going to blow your mind? Let's do it. The day before 9-11, the day before the attacks, Rumsfeld gave a press conference where he talked about trillions of dollars missing. The day. Then a plane slams into the very part of the building where they were doing the accounting. Blows up half the fucking building of the Pentagon. Blows up a wall. Donald Rumsfeld was on, where was it, the White House lawn? Listen to this. This is, a, I, this is like 10 minutes, but is that the Pentagon? This is on C-SPAN. You yeah. can look it up right now. Just li we got to get to the quote where he says... He mentions $2.3 trillion in missing receipts. He talks about his, <laughs> in quote, adversary. <laughs> but see if you can just find the quote. <laughs> the, see, the, just, there's, I know there's YouTube videos. You're, uh, what are you looking at? Is this looking for, yeah, I think that's it. That's right Let's see. What it already spends. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. 
<laughs> okay. Now, again, somebody told you that literally like right before 9-11 happened, they said they, they couldn't track $2.3 trillion. You'd go, no, that didn't happen. That did not happen, but it did happen. What the fuck? Yeah, so think about what Kennedy said. Yeah. Think about what you saw when you saw that Vice movie where Dick Cheney, who was the CEO of Halliburton, becomes the vice president and gets billions of dollars in no-bid contracts. Now think about what we just saw with Donald Rumsfeld saying they couldn't find $2.3 trillion. I don't know where it went. I don't know. I don't know. It seems like we should have had it. So, like, we'll, keep, we'll keep looking. Oh, no. The spot where we looked just blew up. Oh, my God. <laughs> what the Find out hell? if that's true. If the, it was the accounting office, because this is what I love to, I love to say it, because it sounds good, but let's make sure it's true that that part blew up. But either way, that he did say that, and then they did get hit by a plane a couple of days later. <laughs> It's unbelievable. It's so crazy. And two, no one talks about that trillion dollars. No two one talks about the two point three trillion. Two trillions bigger than most countries, right? That it's, could build a whole other country or something. That's two point three million million. You know, that was the that was the theory that Terrence McKenna had to the thing that's gonna change the universe is that one day someone's gonna invent a time machine. And that when they invent a time machine, all time ceases to become linear. So you think if you have a time machine, well, oh, I'll just go back to the time where they were making the pyramids and I'll watch them do it. That's not what it works like. What he was saying, you can't travel where there are no roads. So once a road gets built, then you can travel. So once a time machine gets invented, then anyone from the invention of the time machine forward to forever can come back to that moment and can go to any point in time from that moment to the end of time. So all time ceases to be linear. So there's no like tomorrow will be Wednesday and the next day will be Thursday. No, no, no. It's everything happens everywhere all at once. I so love people this. can travel back and forth through time. You can never own anything because someone could just travel through time and take it away from you when you weren't looking. Like, like as time travel gets more and more sophisticated, you can go back and forth in time while you're talking to people. You know, if you don't like what you said, you could rewind and start all over again. If you're in an argument with your wife, you can go to the library and get information and come back and go, actually, you know, Herodotus once said, and then bam, your, your wife thinks you're the smartest guy in the world. Like this, but it would, it would, would, there would be no normal life anymore. It would like, w the world itself would be completely unrecognizable because time would mean nothing. You'd be able to travel back and forth through time. All right. So then, so then. Where would you go right now? Just if, if I do, we can time travel right now, go back in, in, in the, the past. In the past. Well, What's one thing you'd like to see again? See, that would be a different kind of time travel. That's an unrealistic theatrical version of time travel because, like you said, you, once time is invented, once time travel is invented, that's the time you can start traveling. So you, can so you can't go before that. Right. Okay. So, so, like, here we are. It's May of 2022. If time travel is invented in June, we're, we're not going back to April. You can't go back yeah. to April. Okay. But you can go to from June to a million years in the future and see what people look like. You'll be able to do that. But they'll be able to come back, too, and everything's going to be happening everywhere all at once. There's not going to be any sort of structure to life. There's not going to be anything in terms of money, possessions. As long as you could freely time travel, there will be no time. Everything's going to be moving around. And, and also, instantaneously, you'll become immortal. Because whatever we have right now in terms of technology, what we're going to have in a million years is going to be godlike. Oh and you're going to be able to travel God. to that. If, in fact, that actually does even take place, because the question becomes, like, what is the future if time travel does exist? So if time travel exists in June of 2022, is there even a future? Like, about, about Egypt yeah. and, 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 and about other things. I mean, the specific example I give is above the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid are five further chambers. And these chambers are roofed and floored with granite beams that weigh about 70 tons each. 
and there are hundreds of them. And these 70-ton granite beams, which to put in context, a 70-ton beam is equivalent in weight to 35 large SUVs. These 70-ton granite beams have been elevated to a height of more than 350 feet above the ground and carefully and precisely uh, placed in position. It is very hard for archaeologists to explain how that was done using purely leverage and mechanical advantage. You can say, oh, perhaps they built a ramp and, and, and hauled the stones up the ramp, but then you have to confront basic laws of physics. You can't haul a, a stone weighing tens of tons up a slope that exceeds 10 degrees. Then you start doing the calculation. How long a ramp do I need with a 10 degree slope to get to 350 feet above the ground? Mm -hmm. And the answer is you need a fucking long ramp uh, <laughs> which which should still be there yeah. because not it couldn't have been a sand ramp it would have collapsed under the weight of those stones it had to be as massive as the pyramid itself so this begins to seem like an absurd idea the the, the idea that is foisted on us by archaeology maybe the idea that they regard as absurd namely that psychic powers were cultivated by ancient civilizations that they could use powers of the human mind that we have allowed to lapse maybe that idea deserves further consideration uh, um, we have gone down a path of leverage and mechanical advantage. We're used to relying on machines, but we hear anecdotal reports of people who have telekinetic powers, who can move things with their minds, of people who have telepathic powers. And our automatic reaction is to just dismiss all of that because science says it's impossible, um, be, be, be because uh, science regards consciousness as, as local to the brain and doesn't see how it can exert itself uh, outside of that. But maybe we should open up to those possibilities that we're dealing with a very different kind of culture that used techniques that we have allowed to lapse. And maybe we could wake those techniques up again. Maybe the ability of human beings to do almost superhuman things is resident within all of us, but sleeping. Um, there's a, a very famous painting that shows what appears to be men in crafts flying through the sky in the background of uh, of a uh, an ancient painting. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do. I actually have a page. Uh, one of the first pages I ever put on my website is like a bunch of these because throughout history there are these indications of ships of craft. But like, you know what I'm, the one I'm talking yes. about? It's like and yes. it's that that's the shape of it. It's also like a plate turned on its side, and then there's a person inside yes. of it. Yeah, yeah, man. It's, and it's flying through in that same yeah that's it yeah like look yeah, look it's how incredible. it's it's flying but you know the thing is is that everybody can say or oh, the one above that's pretty cool because that was a hidden thing I've studied that one where it says uh, discovery 15th century above the the her left shoulder there is an object and if you really zoom in look at the dude staring up at it as a painter my wife is a painter everything is intentional. Which guy, where's the guy? The guy on the yeah, right the over front. there. It's right. pretty cool. Looking up. So, so I think that's 15th century. It said. So the the problem with this Joe is it. Go to the original one, the one that we just looked at, Jamie. The one right before that. Yeah. See, so get a big picture. Though. Yeah. That is so strange. Like yeah, here, man. you got Christ being crucified, and then above him, UFOs. Like, yeah. in, is that supposed to be aliens or is that supposed to be angels? Like, so, what is that supposed to be in these things that they have? It's it's real similar to what we're talking about here. That's the argument of miracle of Fatima. Let's say. I mean, again, this is so speculative. We have a, a witness mm -hmm. here, of, you know, pilot. But when you see something like the miracle of Fatima, if you look at what that, is the miracle of Fatima? God, that's that one that was, uh, you know, considered a real miracle by the church, and the three kids were getting messages. I'll get this all wrong, but for like months that they're going to be visited and to bring people in bigger and bigger groups gathered to where there was over a hundred thousand people. What year is this? 1917. 1917. 1917. So, you know, dozens of thousands, if not hundreds, but dozens for sure, see an event, a mass sighting of something that happened. We're talking people that were religious, people that weren't religious, you know, doctors at the That's time. That's not a real image, is it, no, Jamie? That one was doctored a little bit, so you could see, like, they're all looking at something. But that's not real. Yeah, but that's, that's, the, really but that's the crowd, right? The crowd is real. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Pretty so sure so the here's the thing. People come out, something happened that was so intense. Some people thought it was religious, that it was a, a visitation, but other people saw it as technological, like something descended. You know, look into it. I'm just saying art pictures, like paintings we're talking about, man, you can interpret them all day. I can't hold on to that. 
I can't hold on to an eyewitness with other eyewitnesses, with radar systems, and with video. We're in a different era now. We don't have to paint it, man. We get to see it. It's fascinating, man. It is fascinating, but it's way more fascinating when someone like you talks about it versus some fucking random kook. So the Rishot structure, I was on your show a little over a year ago and sh shared some details about it. To people who aren't aware, there's a location in the Western Sahara Desert of Mauritania called the Rishot structure. It's also commonly referred to as the Eye of the Sahara. It is a site that most people have never seen or heard of before, which is truly peculiar because it's so spectacular. It's a site that uh, astronauts typically use to reference from space. It is a geological feature that is said to be volcanic in nature. And what's so spectacular about this is that it just so happens to match more than a dozen striking similarities to what Plato had described as the lost ancient capital city of Atlantis. It's spectacular. So just to run down real quick, Plato had described Atlantis as being the capital. Let me just mention that because it was an empire said to be made up of 10 kingdoms. And what I'm focusing on is the lost capital city, which was said to be made up of concentric circles, three of water, two of land, which matches the Rishot structure. It also was said to have an opening to the sea at the south. And if you look at it from satellite imagery, you can clearly see that water had ran through it. Let's take a look. Um, and furthermore, it was said to have mountains to the north, and you just so happen to have mountains called the Atlas Mountain Chain, which Atlas was said to be the very first king of Atlantis. And what's interesting is that the very first known king of Mauritania, which is where the Rishat structure is located, is also their very first known king was also named Atlas. And though I'm not saying that that's the same individual, but what we do today is we pass down names, right? Like people are like, oh, my dad's name's John, and so is so is my son. And so it's, it's another striking similarity, but it goes further than that. Like there's geological similarities, such as the fact that Atlantis was said to be made up of red, black, and white color stone, which is another similarity you see at the Rishat structure. Um, it was said to have an abundance of gold and that the outer walls were lined with it. And it turns out that Mauritania is loaded with gold. And not only that, the richest person ever known to exist in all of mankind is Mansa Musa of the Mali Empire, which consisted partly of modern day Mauritania. And he was so rich from gold that he would be richer than Elon Musk and like Bezos combined almost. Like many uh, unfathomable amount of billions of, of dollars. So that's another similarity. What year was this? Oh, this is uh, 1300s or 1400s? There he is. Yeah, there we are. 1312, 1337. What a great name too. Mansa yeah. Musa. <laughs> um, but the similarities don't end there. There was said to be an abundance of elephants, which is one reason why to suggest that Atlantis would have been in Africa is because, well, Besides the fact that elephants are known to be in, throughout Africa, they used to be in Mauritania. They're unfortunately pretty much extinct there today. Um, but another little detail that most people aren't aware of because they think of Atlantis like, oh, it must be at the bottom of the ocean. Well, that's not exactly how Plato worded it. He did describe that the aftermath of Atlantis followed a catastrophic event involving water is that, is that what was left of Atlantis was reeds of grass and a shoal of mud that prevented ships from navigating to and additionally, uh, Atlantis, the capital, was said to have a river that went just north of it or next to it. And the Taman Rasat River went right through the Rishat structure or just north of it, went all the way to the Atlas Mountains that I described, which is in modern day Morocco. Um, and the evidence is that it existed at that same period of time when Atlantis was said to be around 11,600 years ago prior to its destruction up until about 5,000 years ago. So going Um, on the last podcast we did, he was talking about these studies that are doing, they're doing out of a university in England where they're doing a slow drip DMT um, experience with these people. And because they're doing it for hours and hours, they do a slow drip where they're con they keep them in this state, Whoa. which is normally a very transient state. Well, because you hit it with a fucking pipe. Yeah. Normally. Yeah, yeah, normally. So there's no regulating how much you get. Right. So this because it's an IV cuz it's coming in a drip, it's like constant and continuous and these people are going to the same place and they're having repeatable experiences. So instead of having like a 15 minute DMT trip, which is a lot of people have that's like overwhelming, you can't even figure out what's going on, then it's over. Instead of that, you're going to the exact same place over and over and over again and getting more and more comfortable with it and coming back with 
very similar stories. Really? So, yeah, it's a repeatable environment where they're encountering entities and they're trying to map it. So these people are doing these long-term studies with long-term experiments, meaning like not a 15-minute term, but like a, not a 15-minute trip, but multiple hours at a time. And they're coming back with like a map of the territory. So the, the, this is the concept. The theory that many people have is that death opens up a chemical gateway in the mind. And that chemical gateway takes whatever the soul is, whatever consciousness is, and transports it into this new realm. It allows you, your conscious mind, to access this new realm, which is available to you upon death. And so a lot of the ancient cultures that did ayahuasca and, all, and, and mushrooms, they would talk about this realm as being like a well of souls that you encounter disembodied life forms, disembodied spirits. And this has been, uh, it's been a staple of so many religions. There's so many religions that talk about the afterlife. I mean, I get that you would wanna come up with something like that just because you wanted to have some sort of a reason to keep going with the rational mind when you're dealing with the existential angst of a temporary existence and one day you're just going to be worm food what's the point of it all why don't i end it now yeah. it's too much life is to live is to suffer no there's something waiting for you when it's over and this is like the, that's the carrot at the end of the stick so a lot of people think well i'm too smart for that fucking carrot like no 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 life is suffering life is pointless and it goes black so, one day. It's like what Bourdain did to himself. It's like there's like this romantic notion that some people have that to end this depressing thinking is like to just to do it just to end your own life is the best way to just get through this. And they got imprisoned. And they had a lot of resentment towards Kennedy. I mean, I go into the book Still. a little bit about the Kennedy assassination and the belief that a lot of, that a handful of those Cubans may have been involved in the Kennedy assassination along with the Italians, with the mob, because they were working hand in hand with the CIA. Yeah, that was one of the leading conspiracies outside yeah. of the CIA killing him. And even the CIA killing him was a part of the Bay of, Con the Bay of Pigs conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. And also the, the idea that he wanted to disband the CIA. There was a really interesting article recently that was dismissing almost every single conspiracy theory about the Kennedy assassination. They said, except the CIA one. There's legitimate possibilities that the CIA... Well, well you can bet your ass that if the CIA was involved, then Cubans were involved. Yeah. Now, let me ask yeah. you something. In the book, you speak about Fidel's mistress. Yeah, that he got disenchanted with her at this particular one. <laughs> Marita, she had, she had gone to New Orleans, or, yeah, or to Dallas. Marita Loren. Ah. This is very interesting. Notorious figure. She had a child with him uh, and had an abortion and didn't have the child. She got pregnant with Fidel. In fact, Castro admitted as much. She got pregnant with Castro. She had a, she had an abortion, and then the CIA used her to try to assassinate Castro. Um, she had was supposed to slip him a pill and she put it in her um, face cream and the pill dissolved in her face cream and that was the pill she was going to try to slip to Castro. Her, her case agent was a guy named Frank Sturgis who wound up being one of the Watergate burglars. See, the thing about Bay of Pigs and the Cubans, uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion is the key to understanding the whole latter part of the 20th century politics in the United States, the Cold War, because the alliance between the CIA and the Cubans rears its head constantly throughout the latter part of the 20th century. The Watergate burglary, five out of seven of the burglars were Cubans, Bay of Pigs veterans. Really? They had been recruited by a guy named E. Howard Hunt, CIA agent who was one of the orchestrators of the Bay of Pigs invasion. Who was also one of the people that on his deathbed said that he was involved in the assassination of yeah. Kennedy. Yes. This, so the CIA would come to these Cuban exiles, the militant exiles, and they'd say, go do this operation. Go do this burglary at the, at the Watergate, and then we go get Fidel. Have go do this assassination, and then we go get Fidel. And the Cubans were always ready and willing. Because it was all leading back to getting Fidel. It was